Welcome everybody to tonight's educational forum. My name is Kathy Jones. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Alabama. We have several different series where we are focusing on different topics that we think voters should be really paying attention to. Uh, tonight, we're going to learn about civic engagement and advocacy. We've got a fantastic a panelist. I'm going to hand this off to Rebecca Jackson, who is the co-chair of the League of Women Voters of Alabama advocacy team, and she will introduce the panelists. Uh, if everyone will put your questions in the chat, we won't be answering them during the forum, but at the end, when they've finished the, the discussion, then we'll switch to questions and answers. So thank you all, and I'm going to hand it off to Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm very excited for all y'all tonight. We've got a fabulous group of panelists. We have Patricia Todd, she is a former state representative, and she is currently the Southern Policy Manager and Lobbyist for Jobs to Move America, and she is also a Birmingham League member. Robin Buckaloo is a retired professional engineer and advocacy director for the League of Women Voters of Alabama. And then finally, we have Tara Bailey. She is the founder of I Vote Madison. She is on the League of Women Alabama Voters, oh, I'm sorry, the League of Women Voters of Alabama's Education Fund and Director of the Alabama Channel. So we're gonna start with Patricia Todd and she will start by giving us an introduction to the Alabama legislature. Patricia. Thank you for that. And I'm so excited about this and so excited to see the amount of people that are, are here to learn more about it. Having served in the legislature for 12 years, I'm hopefully will give a different perspective um, about how the legislature functions. So let me see if I can get this going in. Um, uh, let's see. I have to move that slideshow. There, come on. Okay. Um, you know, most people really don't know about much about the legislature, but that's where I'm going to focus. Um, I served 12 years in the legislature. I've been an activist for many, many years. Um, I've founded Kentucky Now and worked for three years in their national office, served as a board member for Equality Alabama. I've been executive director for the Human Rights Campaign, executive director for Birmingham AIDS Outreach and AIDS Alabama. Um, so what we're going to talk about is how the legislature functions or dysfunctions, who influences voting, how to contact your legislators, and the most effective methods of contact. So I'd be interested by a show of hands of people on this call. How many of you have ever contacted your state legislature? Just raise your hand. Okay. Great, great, great. All right, lot people get involved in politics and legislative actions for different reasons. Some are due to taxation issues, like many people here are probably concerned about removing the tax on groceries. Um, it may affect your rights, like who you can marry. Um, many, it may be about public safety, gun laws, education, what your child learns in school. We know we're having a debate in the legislature. We'll continue to on critical race theory, uh, maybe reg regarding employment um, and whether or not you've been convicted of a felony and how that might impact your ability to get employment. And then healthcare, obviously with Roe v. Wade being overturned last year, a lot of people have been engaged in politics due to that. So. I'd like to know if you would post in the chat what issue is are you the most passionate about? So let's talk a little bit about the Alabama legislature. We just went through an election. All the legislators were up for re-election. Um, there are 140 members in the legislature. There are 35 in the Senate and 105 in the House. And um, yeah, the party affiliation has not changed with that election. We have 104 Republicans and 36 Democrats, which you can see 
may be problematic. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on when you don't have um, when you have one party that dominates any legislative body can be problematic and um, that they really the Democrats don't even have to show up for the Republicans to, you know, uh, take action. The race breakdown, there are 37 black legislators. One of those is Republican from Shelby County. I'm sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Um, and then there are 130 white members. We have one might, this is an important statistic that's scary to me. There's one white member in the House and one white Democratic member in the Senate. So it is not a diverse legislator legislature at all. There's only 22 women in the legislature. We're ranked 47th in the country for female representation. So let's look at who holds the power. One thing that you need to know when you're dealing with the legislature is who holds the power, um, who has the power to move legislation or get people to vote on legislation. So the most important uh, leaders in the chambers are the Speaker of the House um, and the Lieutenant Governor in the Senate. Um, those two people actually run the um, the day's activities, call on people, and um, so they are very powerful players. Um, they also appoint committee they appoint committee chairs and members to committees, and they assign bills to committees. And um, it's important because sometimes bills don't go to the committee that you would naturally think they would. Sometimes. Um, the speaker, lieutenant governor, will assign it to a committee to kill a bill. So you have to be aware of that. The rules committee is a committee most people don't really think about, but they have a powerful uh, position in the legislature. Every bill that comes out of committee moves to the rules committee. And the rules committee members decide what bills will make it onto the agenda for the next legislative day. Um, each member on the rules committee gets to pick one or two bills, depending on how many bills they want to deal with on the next day. So say, for example, when one of my bills would move out of committee, I had to go and talk to a member of the rules committee to ask them to pick my bill. It's not an automatic thing that happens. It has to be selected by a member. Then you have the majority and minority leaders. These are the two members of each party that sort of holds their members accountable on the floor, um, sort of um, manages who speaks and encourages people to say this, that, or the other. So they do have a great deal of power. Lobbyists have a great deal of power. Alabama has a lot of lobbyists. Um, there are probably six or seven lobbyists for every member of the legislature. Um Lobbyists are paid by organizations to influence uh, voting. A lot of times they're the ones who are actually drafting legislation and driving legislation uh, because they're the experts on a particular issue. Then there are the clerks. These are committee clerks um, that assist the chair of the committee. They have all access to the legislature and to the committee chair and members. Um, they are the gatekeepers, so it's really important to know who the clerk is for the committee that your bill is uh, is moving through. And really, pe uh, two people that you don't really think about are the receptionists, both at the House and the Senate. They are the people that will can tell you where offices are. They can ask for members to come out of the chamber and talk to you. Um, and it's always good to have a good relationship with them because if they really don't like you, they're not going to be very helpful to you. So never underestimate the power of the receptionists. Okay. So the leadership, doesn't that picture look familiar? White men dominate leader ship positions and have for decades in Alabama. No, that's not shocking to anybody. Uh, the lieutenant governor presides over the Senate. His name is Will Ainsworth. He just won re-election. He's a Republican. In uh, Senate pro tem, um, he runs the floor action. That's Greg Reed. He's from Jasper. He's a Republican. 
The Speaker of the House presides over the House. That's Nathaniel Ledbetter. He's new. He'll be the new Speaker. And then the Speaker Pro Tem is Chris Engel, uh, Pringle. He's from Mobile, Republican, new. I mean, he's not new to the legislature, but that's a new position for him. And then the majority leader is um, really manages the floor in the House. Scott Stand Deridge, he's a Republican. He's new in that position. The minority leader, which controls the majority party floor, uh, that's annually Anthony Daniels. He's from um, Huntsville, and he has served in this position for the last quadrennium. I'm having a hard time advancing these slides. Um, okay. I find this picture sort of funny because I think a lot of people suggested that legislators ought to wear patches of their major donors so you know who who they're really speaking for, um, which I actually think would be a great idea. Um, but there are 31 new members in the House. Um, we had one Democrat flipped a black male by a white male, and we had one Republican flip a white woman by a white male. So we lost one black house member um, in the in the past election. There are six new members in the Senate, and there's no change in the number of D's and R. And why, why is this important? Well, it's important because new members are clueless in in their first session. They many of them don't even know where the bathroom is. Um, they don't know how things really work behind the scenes. Um, usually. It's you're, it's easier to get something to make friends with a new member because they are so new and they're trying to sort of figure out the lay of the land as such. So if, if you have a new member that represents your and first thing you need to do is find out who represents you in the legislature. And you can do that through the League of Women Voters website. <laughs> so if you're following a bill. Um, here's some things you need to know. You need to know what committee it's assigned to and who are the members of that committee. Now, they're going through an organizational session this week where all the committees will be selected and all members will be, they'll know what their committee assignments are. So hopefully by next week on the website, you'll be able to track that. You need to know if your legislator serves on that committee. You need to know the bill number, the sponsor and the co-sponsor. Now, a lot of times legislators, this was true of me, I couldn't tell you what bill numbers were. If somebody calls me and says, I want you to support House Bill 20. Many times I didn't know what House Bill 20 was. You have to tell me what the subject is because um, there's hundreds of pieces of legislation that get introduced. Um, you need to find out if your legislator is a sponsor or co-sponsor of the bill. I'm going to show you the legislative website in a minute so you can find that out. You need to find out if the leadership is in favor or oppose the bill that will have a huge impact on whether the bill moves or not. Um, and does their party support or oppose the bill? Um, you also need to know when it's in committee, every bill gets assigned to a committee by the by the speaker. Um, you can always call for a public hearing on a bill, even if you support or oppose a bill. Um, that's a way to sort of get educate committee members and the public about what the bill is about. But in the first part of the session, that will delay the actual vote on the bill for a week. Um, you know, and also, if you've got a bill in committee that you want to make sure gets out, you need to get a member of the committee lined up to call the question so it can actually go to a vote. The chair can move a bill to subcommittee. Sometimes that's used in a way to kill the bill. Um, so it just sort of disappears. Um, make sure that you can count the votes on the committee. And um, also know the fiscal impact of the bill that you're supporting or opposing, because that will have a, a, a big influence on whether people you know, want to move it or not. So do's and don'ts. You need to wear appropriate attire when you're in the state house. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that you have to wear a dress suit or anything like that. You can wear jeans, but make sure you have an appropriate, you know, top on. Um, when the house is going into session or coming out of session, 
you have to stay behind a rope area while they're moving back and forth that's so they can have clear access to their offices you need to find out where your legislator's office is um, you can find that out from the receptionist they do move them around every quadrennium so don't assume you know um, you need to ca call them um, either representative or, or senator um, it, and you can do this while they're in session. You can ask the receptionist to call you, the, a member out of session to talk with you. And most of the times they will do that. Um, but you have to ask for your representative or senator. You can't, they're not likely to want to talk to you if you don't live in their district. So don't, things don't do. While you're in a committee hearing, don't raise your hand or talk during committee meetings. This is, you know, the, the chair's not gonna recognize you if you're in the audience. Um, they frankly don't care. Uh, don't yell at a legislator. I've had that happen to me. That'll get you in trouble with security pretty quickly. <laughs> um, don't block the hallways as they're coming in and out of a session. Don't argue or raise your voice to a legislator and you cannot bring any weapons into the state house. So who influences policy? You know, we'd like to think it's average citizens, but the reality is it's mostly lobbyists because they're the ones who are distributing PAC money to candidates. Um, and the political parties, they're gonna try to enforce their platforms and hold their members accountable to what their platforms say. The leadership of both chambers, because they're the ones who assign bills and they appoint committee chairs. Um, and then businesses, because they're also the ones who are distributing money during campaigns. Now, in Alabama, um, they're not able to raise any money for their campaigns um, from now until they run for re-election. And, and that's significant. Um, special interest groups, you know, the League of Women Voters is considered a special interest group. Um, and their influence comes from the amount of people not necessarily the money that you distribute, but the amount of people you can show up or get to take action. And then donors, the people who have given money to candidates obviously have an influence. So what do you say when you're talking to a legislator? You need to introduce yourself, tell them where you live, make sure that you tell them that you're in your district. You don't have to tell them whether you voted for them or not. Um, you need to state your position on the bill, number, and content, whether you're for or against it. Then ask them where they stand on the issue. If they support it, thank them. If they oppose it, give them some facts on why you support the bill. And then send a follow-up email thanking them for their time. This does not have to be a lengthy conversation. They don't have the tolerance for that. Just, you know, I'm for House Bill 1. Here's why. I'd like to know what you think about it. They support it, thank them. If they're opposed to it, give them a couple of more facts. You probably know more about the bill than they do. So how do you raise your voice above the crowd of people who are talking to them? Your influence is your voice in your vote. They work for you. Um, really try to recruit others to join you in contacting the legislator. So you got a couple of friends or family members, neighbors who agree with you on a piece of legislation, ask them to contact their legislator. Keep contacting them with new information. Uh, don't let them ignore you. I'm gonna tell you, they will ignore you. Um, and thank them again if they agree with you. It's important to visit them while they're in the state house. That's when you've got um, an audience. Um, they don't make appointments, so don't think you're going to call up and say, can I come by your office at one and talk? You know, they're going to avoid that. So, um, but you, you can go to the state house when they're in session, try to find them in their office or call them out on the floor. Don't overwhelm them with a lot of documents. You wouldn't believe the amount of information a legislator receives and they don't read it. So if you're going to give them something, make it five bullet points with your contact information. 
It's important to join organizations that are on your side, like the League of Women Voters. Um, and then, you know, find out who they listen to or who sits next to them on the floor, because um, that's who they're going to be talking to. So how do you change their mind? Well, you need to read the bill. Uh, they don't read all the bills. They're dependent on lobbyists to tell them what's the content of the bill. There's only one person I know in the House when I served that read every single bill, and that's Laura Hall. Uh, she reads every single bill. She has a copy of every single bill on her desk. Um, and she is very well respected because she does that. You need to tell them why you support or oppose a bill. Make it personal. Um, you need to get the facts. Determine why they have the position they do on a bill. Um, don't be hostile. And ask if there's anything you can do to change their mind. So communicating with the legislator, you know, some forms are more effective than others. And um, the easiest is obviously to send a form email or sign a petition. But I'm telling you, those are the most ineffective ways to convince, a, you know, because for me, it was like, if you didn't care any more about a piece of legislation than to sign a form, or just click forward on an email, you know, did you really care? I'd rather get a one paragraph personal email from somebody that meant more to me than a petition, because most of the times you can't verify that people who sign the petition actually live in your district. Communicate personalized information um, on your own email is, is very effective. A phone call to the state house or district office. Now, they all have phones in their office. Most of them are not in their office, or they're not going to answer the phone. You can call and leave a message with the receptionist, and they will give them the message. Now, that's real easy for them to just like you know, wad it up and throw in the trash. The best thing to do, and the most effective thing to do, is have a personal meeting. Uh, either in the state house, some of them have town hall meetings, or call them while they're in district and say, do you have time for have coffee? You know, these are not like members of con Congress who have district offices. Most of them do not. Um, and I love this thing from ACOU. It's like, you know, email them, meet with them, call them, repeat. You've just got to keep repeating and getting more people to do the same thing. So why people don't contact their legislator? A lot of times people feel like, well, they're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, it's not going to make a difference, they're not going to they're not going to listen to me. A lot of people feel intimidated talking to an elected official. But let me say this, they're just like you. They're your neighbors and they work for you. Sometimes it's not easy to find who their contact information like right now on the legislative website they don't have any of their emails listed. I don't understand that. Um, sometimes they don't care because you didn't vote for them. So they really don't care what you think. Um, a lot, I've heard a lot of people say, I don't know who my legislator is. Well, now you're going to know because the League of Women Voters can get you in touch with them. Or people will say, I just don't have the time. It takes five minutes to make that contact. Hopefully you care more about that issue and don't let that stop you. So what to expect? Don't expect a reply because they're not going to reply to you. They just don't. Um, they're rarely in their offices. You can leave a message on their door of their office. Um, you know, they don't draft their own bills. Um, they are very easily distracted. So if you find one in the hallway and you're like, I'm so-and-so, I live in your district, can I talk to you about so-and-so? They're going to get distracted by a lobbyist or somebody else coming by. So just realize that. Um, they don't gonna, they're not going to read the materials you leave. Most of them don't have a local office. And only some counties do, like Madison, Mobile. You know, Jefferson County doesn't even have a local office. Um, 
they're on their phones all the time or they have others in their office. You just have to be persistent. Now, when you're communicating with the legislator, the general uh, rule of thumb is it's going to be their first name, dot, last name at either alhouse.gov or alsenate.gov. The don'ts, don't assume that they're going to read all their emails because they don't. Um, you need to check out their Facebook page. Check out their legislative page. You know, you can leave a message at the receptionist desk, leave a note on their office door, ask them to contact you. Again, be persistent. Why they don't seem to care? It's not a priority issue for them. It's not on their immediate radar. They're too busy focusing on other legislation. They know you didn't vote for them, so they really don't care what you think. And it's not an issue that affects their district. So, how to find your legislator? You can go to the League of Women Voters website. You can also go to the Secretary of State's website. You enter your address. It's going to tell you who your elected officials are. And I can't tell you how many times I do these kind of seminars or talk to groups and ask them how many people know who your elected officials are. And they might name a member of Congress or um, a U.S. Senator, but they have no idea who their local legislator is. So the legislative website, you need to get familiar with that. Um, if, you, if you click on it, which I'm going to go to right now, it will come up to this where it's got the House, the Senate. Um, it'll have a live stream link here. So they're in session What you can live stream. But now that the women, League of Women Voters has this Alabama channel, you don't have to you know, watch it live. If you've got a bill search, um, I actually send this up, set this up for me every legislative session where I go in and I list certain bills that I want to track. Um, so that's where you might do that. It will also tell you about session info, what time they're coming in. Uh, what's going to be on the calendar that day. So it's very helpful. You really need to get familiar with that, with that website. If I go back to my presentation, um, which but sometimes I love Zoom and sometimes I'm like, mm. um, the, the thing that's really... <laughs> Don't, don't expect that, um, honestly, they can be a really rude, um, unresponsive. I'm a, even as a former legislator, and I know a lot of the people that serve now, and as a lobbyist, I am amazed how many do not respond to an email that I send. That's just the lay of the land. So um, if you're very committed to a bill, like I know I, uh, as a league member and I'm chair of the Alabama Sunlight uh, Coalition, we're working on some changes to the Open Records Act to make sure that that's an easier process. Um, and we're going to be tracking some bills um, in this coming session. We'll actually be introducing a couple of bills. Um it's uh, you'll you'll be amazed at what they will oppose or support during the session. Um, they haven't posted any pre-filed bills yet, which usually they do before the session starts. The session starts, I think, the first Tuesday in March. Um, so you've got a little time to get used to it. But this Web page is very uh, informational and you need to know it'll tell you what's coming up every day. It'll give you a tracking of every bill. Uh, where it is. You can look at who sits on what committee. Um, so it's important to become familiar with that. And that's sort of a simple overview. Um, the main thing I want to emphasize is please, please, please don't be intimidated by contacting a legislator. Um, they need to hear from us. Um, you know, Alabama's got a long way to go. <laughs> and we have a lot of issues to work on and we have to be ones that are, you know, holding them accountable. So 
thank you to the League of Women Voters for giving me the opportunity to walk through this. Um, uh, my email address is reptod at gmail.com. If you have any questions or anything, please, please, please feel free to contact me. And I plan to be in the State House a lot and hope to see you all there. Thank you all so much. Patricia, thank you so much. It's really valuable to have your insight as a former legislator, um, considering that's who we're trying to influence. So um, you know how they think. You used to be one. Um, now we're going to go to Robin. She is going to share with us an overview on the League of Women Voters of Alabama and their advocacy work. Um, so, Robin. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's good to be here tonight, and I'm delighted to see the number of participants that, that are tuned in in spite of the championship game. So I'm going to discuss advocacy a little bit. Webster's defines advocacy as the action of advocating, pleading for, or supporting. An advocate is one that pleads the cause of another or one that argues for, defends, maintains, or recommends a cause or proposal. In the context of the League of Women Voters of Alabama, the latter definition is our operational one. The way we're organized, Voter Services supports individuals in attaining or restoring their voting rights, and advocacy proposes policy and legislative changes which improve citizens' opportunities for civic engagement including their ability to vote. Obviously, there's a fine line between voter services and advocacy, and many league members work in both areas. Many of the issues that voter services identify as problems for numbers of individuals result in proposals for actions by the advocacy group. Kathy Jones conceived the current concept for advocacy operations several years ago when she was state secretary, and it's been a really interesting ride. Our first big effort was working on people-powered fair maps, PPFM, under a grant from the National League, which extended over three years, leading up to the redistricting effort, which took place after the 2020 census. We in Alabama analyzed gerrymandering in urban areas. We learned map making, and we ultimately Sponsored, sponsored the development of an example map to show that it's actually very feasible to place Alabamians in districts that do not break up their communities of interest. <coughs> League of Women Voters members spoke at redistricting hearings all over the state, often speaking from personal experience of living in a gerrymandered neighborhood. We were joined in the hearings by speakers from other organizations who spoke to the same issues. It's true that the state legislature ignored citizens' inputs and many of their own legislative members and passed blatantly unfair maps. But subsequent lit litigation is still before the Supreme Court and the league is in this for the long game. So what, what I'm doing is I'm giving examples of advocacy that we have been participating in over the past several years because everyone doesn't necessarily like the same cup of tea, but there is a lot of there's a lot that can be done in a lot of different areas of activity. So advocacy has conducted meetings both in person and by Zoom with various state legislators and other officials. One very successful meeting we had was with Cam Ward, the director of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles. This resulted in a policy change on their part that made it a little bit easier for formerly incarcerated people to have their voting rights restored. So if you're that person that's getting your voting rights restored, that's a big win for you. Last election, the advocacy team analyzed proposed state constitutional amendments as they were related to voting rights restoration and other positions of the National League. We submitted recommendations to the state board on which ones to support, to oppose, or to stay neutral on. League of Women Voters of Alabama published the resulting positions, and I know for a fact 
that some members of the public followed our recommendations during the election. This coming legislative session, we plan to analyze proposed legislation to determine which pieces of legislation impact issues on which the league has a position so that we can determine whether we oppose or concur with those bills. A big issue for the league is government transparency, which uh, Patricia Todd alluded to briefly in her talk. We've been pushing open records law reform for several years and supporting open meetings legislation. Transparency is foundational to all that the league is trying to accomplish. If we don't know what's going on in Montgomery or in our local city councils, it's very hard to promote change. Right now, a state agency doesn't even have to respond to a Freedom of Information Act request. The League of Women Voters of Alabama and several local leagues have produced a number of educational fora over the last several years. The aim is to inform as many voters in Alabama as possible of issues of concern to them. For example, advocacy hosted a forum on reproductive law in the fall, following the overturn of Roe versus Wade. The format was strictly educational. Rather than take a position on Alabama's laws respecting pregnancy and birth, we tried to present the legal implications of those laws. We want the public to understand potential issues for themselves and their families. For these fora and for many of our other league efforts, coalition building is essential. We have participated in building a wonderful Alabama Voting Rights Coalition. All the members of the various groups have come together in agreement on what constitutes a worthwhile bill to improve the ability of the formerly incarcerated to restore their voting rights. Last legislative session, we came very close to getting a bill passed. We also participate in coalitions in which other groups do the heavy lifting and we take a supporting role. A good example of this is our support for Alabama Appleseed's efforts to get legislation passed to prevent citizens from losing driver's licenses for non-driving offenses. The League of Women Voters of Alabama has a blog edited and mostly written by Tuscaloosa member, Catherine Davies. This is another weapon in our arsenal to help us get our issues in front of the public. An example of one of her blogs was a piece written on the far reaching implications for an individual and family of losing one's driver's license. One of our most exciting current endeavors is called the Alabama Channel. The League of Women Voters of Alabama received a Making Democracy Work Grant from the National League. The Alabama Channel is a transparency tool to make greater civic engagement in the state possible. Tara Bailey heads it, and she will be discussing it next. Of course, the advocacy team can't make everything happen by itself. We hope to energize League advocates from all over the state. There are all kinds of opportunities to participate. We need league members to attend our fora, like you all are tonight. We need them to encourage other people to do so. We need members to help educate the citizens of our state. In particular, we need response to our calls to action. We know from talking to state legislators that they hear from even 10 constituents on a particular bill, that is a lot of of interest from the constituency. A call to action might be to mail postcards to the legislators representing your district, a personal postcard from yourself. It might be to place a call or an email. It might be to gather at a government building with signs to call attention to a good or a bad piece of legislation. When the league sends out a call to action, we need every relevant member and members friends to take action. That is how we will make progress in this state. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I'm seeing some really great, great questions in the chat and we'll, we'll circle back to those. So feel free to continue to drop those into the chat. But next we're gonna hear from Tara Bailey and she's gonna discuss the Alabama channel and how folks can use it 
for advocacy and just being a more engaged and informed voter and citizen. Unmute myself. All right. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I'm so excited to be here this evening and see so many people on the call tonight. I know many will probably watch the replay because of the game, um, but for the next few minutes, I'll be walking you through what the Alabama channel is and how to use it as a civic engagement tool. So the Alabama channel is a website that provides simple, searchable, live and recorded footage of Alabama's legislative meetings. It is a project of the League of Women Voters of Alabama Education Fund. If you're somewhat new to civic engagement or need a refresher, I would recommend starting with the issues you care about most. You may choose to limit your areas of interest to one to three topics in order to avoid getting overwhelmed. For this presentation, I will be talking about how to engage at the state level, but want to encourage you to get engaged at the local government level as well. To research your topics, you can use Allison, Alabama's legislative website, which stands for the Alabama Legislative Information Service Online. You can use the Alabama channel to see and follow legislative meetings and learn what's being said about the issues you care about. You can connect with organizations who are working on the topics you're interested in, like the League of Women Voters. You can look through past news articles, or you can see what legislation other states may have passed related to the topics you're interested in, really anything that involves research. So for Allison, I recommend checking out the Quick Clicks user guide to understand where key information is housed on the website, such as bills, meeting schedules, and information about legislators. You can use Allison to see past bills and current bills. This graphic is showing legislation from 2022. Since the Alabama channel first began recording Alabama's legislative meetings starting in late February of 2022, the only bills you'll find videos of are those that were live streamed and discussed in committee or in the House or Senate after that time. Of course, we will be live streaming and recording all the videos going forward um, as well. So you can use the search bar to type in the topic you're interested in, for this demonstration, I chose voting. You will see that all of the bills dealing with voting from the 2022 session are displayed here. You wanna pay close attention to the current status and last action of the bill. If it says read for the first time and referred to committee, this means the bill didn't get discussed in the committee and there will be no video footage of the bill on the Alabama channel. Even if there is no footage, you can still read the bill and see who sponsored or co-sponsored it. You can also see which committee the bill was sent to and use the Alabama channel to view meetings of that committee. The decision on whether a committee hears a bill falls on the chair of the committee. If it says read second time, there may be footage of the bill on the Alabama channel. You'll see that I found a bill that says it was read for a second time in the second house. That bill number is HB or House Bill 63. Now I'm going to switch over to the hey, Alabama channel. Tara, you might want to yep. reduce the, the Zoom panel. It's over right on oh, is top it? of Can what you see you're it? I apologize. There yeah, we go. That's, that's perfect. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> thanks. So this is the Alabama channel, and you get there by going to thealabamachannel.org. Um, this is essentially, you know, like I said, the simple, searchable, live and recorded video footage of Alabama's legislative meetings but we're wanting to make it so much more than that. This is a voter education resource. At the bottom of here on the, of the page, you will see that you can find your legislator, contact your links to contact your legislator, follow a bill, or access voter services. We encourage you to look through the entire website, but for the purposes of this meeting, I wanna draw your attention to the watch meetings button. So if you go here, you will see that there are currently no live meetings happening. And what this means is that Allison, the legislative website, is not currently live streaming anything, so the Alabama channel is not currently live streaming anything. Um, when the meetings are being live streamed, we not only live stream to our website, but we also live stream to our YouTube page, Facebook page, and Twitter page. So that, that will house, um, in the live sessions, it'll say either House, Senate, House committee, Senate committees, or joint committees. And then when you click on it, you'll see what's live. 
So the Alabama channel, all the videos that are housed can be searchable by transcript. And that's what makes this tool pretty powerful. So if you remember, we typed, we looked at House Bill 63 when we were looking at voting. And if I hit search after typing House Bill 63, you're gonna see every single time House Bill 63 was mentioned in any one of our videos that we've captured so far. So the first video here is the Alabama House of Representatives and the date was March 17th. And if you go down, you will see captions that display a little bit about what was talked about regarding House Bill 63. And that, you know, it appeared in a few different meetings. So if you go to the hyperlink on the first video, just to see what was said, it will take you directly. House Bill 63, House Bill 63 only deals with voter. It will take you directly to that moment where whatever you typed was mentioned. It could be a bill, it could be a topic that you're interested in, it will take you to that moment. If you find an interesting moment that you would like to share with your friends and family, if it's something you care about and you want to share with them, all you have to do is hit the share button. And that will allow you to share that to Facebook, Twitter. Um, you can embed it on a website if you have a website. You can also copy this hyperlink and put it in an email to send it to someone. Um, also pointing out if there was a more broader conversation around House Bill 63 and say, you just found that hyperlink and went to that exact moment, you can actually go back just a little bit in order to grab that entire conversation. And then once you get there, you can say it was 3.55.09 and you can go ahead and change the start time to whatever that is so that when you send it, people get ex right to that moment you want them to see quickly. Um, there is a disclaimer on our site that makes sure everybody is aware that this is a product of the Legal Women Voters of Alabama Education Fund and it is not affiliated with Alabama state government. We also want to point out the videos are transcribed using YouTube's automatic transcription tool, so they may not be 100% accurate, um, but it's actually pretty done pretty well. Um, from there, you know, you can search anything and, you, and I encourage all of you to take some time, find some moments of interest and go ahead and share them on social media and play with it and let people know what you care about. It's really just a great tool to do that. Um, the Alabama channel not only is educating Alabamians, but it's helping to educate our legislators as well. Um, currently, you know, all of Alabama's legislative meetings are only live streamed and not recorded. And so what that means is when a bill goes through a committee, before that bill gets voted on in the House, those House members are unable to see what happened to that bill during the committee meeting. And so now this gives everybody a chance to see what exactly was said so that they're as prepared as they can be when they go to vote on legislation, because we all know that legislators get bombarded with all kinds of bills um, during a session. So with that, I will go ahead and pause and then wait on your questions. Thank you. Kara, I am so excited. Thank you for sharing, but also I am personally very excited about the Alabama channel. And every time you do a demonstration, I learn something new and am, uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start with a couple quick questions and then go into um, some broader questions that we have and feel free to drop any questions that y'all have for any of our panelists into the box. Um, Robin, I'm going to start. We had a question in the chat that said, uh, what were the changes that pardons and parole made? Okay, it was a policy change to in, in which they decided that they would not count fines and fees that were not repaid that were for non-disqualifying offenses. So up until that point, they were basically holding ex formerly incarcerated people who had completed their sentence for their disqualifying conviction responsible for paying all their fines and fees back instead of just the ones that related to the disqualifying conviction. And this basically permanently uh, disenfranchised a lot of people uh, because it included all kinds of things that, that were not disqualifying. So I said it made it a little bit easier because it, it lightened the load of the, the money that they would have to pay back 
before they could get their voting rights back. Okay, uh, Patricia, I have another quick question for you that came through the chat. Um, have you heard anything of any special sessions that may occur before the regular session? No, I don't think they'll have a special session before the regular session. And they do have an organizational session starting this week. tomorrow. Yeah, but that's setting the rules of the body, not passing legislation. Correct, correct. So. All right, well, I'm going to ask this question to all of y'all, and we can take turns. I'll start with you, Tara. Um, so what is a quick tip for someone who is new to advocacy? Um, I think a quick tip is just to jump in. You know, don't overthink it. Join some organizations. Get next to some people who have been in this game for a while and learn. And that, that's what I would say. Robin, do you have a, a tip for people just getting started? Yeah. Find something that you really, really care about and investigate that and see what the, the legal situation is on that and pick that to be your, your cause that you, that you want to pursue. And Patricia, do you have any other tips for beginners? I, I just think that, you know, you have to step into it and don't be intimidated. And, um, you know, they work for you. You're a voter and um, they should they should respect and listen to you. And, and I'll share one as well as kind of thinking through your presentation, Patricia, that you have to find a way to communicate with your legislators. So some legislators are super active on Twitter. So if you use Twitter, that might be a way to reach them. Some do use their legislative email. Some never check it. Some are phone people. Like it's a little bit like your relatives, you know, some relatives will text and some will call. You have to figure out what works for your legislators. True. Um, this is a question that came from Kathy. Um, and I'll, I'll give this to you, Patricia. Um, how many people do you think it would take, I guess, in Montgomery at a meeting to really catch legislators eyes on an issue? Well, you know, a lot of organizations have advocacy days where like, you know, dozens of people show up, but I actually think, you know, get it, two or three people that support a bill, get, make a trip to Montgomery, you know, sit in their office, call them out. I mean, that can be effective as well. You, you would be amazed how little, um it takes to get their attention if i got emails that were unique from four or five different people on a position on a bill i took i, I was like okay this is important i need to pay attention to it okay um if you can't make it to montgomery what are some other ways that you can be influential during the legislative session email them call them uh, leave a message for them. Um, call them while they're back in their district. Unfortunately, the website doesn't always list a local number for them. That's problematic. Or contact the committee that they're on. Each committee has a clerk who should be able to give you personal information on how to contact a member. Robin or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um. You know, there's there's a lot you can do from home. <laughs> um, me being a mother of three with a child with a couple comorbidities, I can't just walk into buildings right now and expose myself to to viruses and things. And so I, you know, talk to your friends, reach out to your family, you know, share share your stories with your social circle and encourage them to go ahead and reach out um, out to their legislators and use the Alabama channel to find those things and share them out because I feel like video is very impactful. Um, sometimes if you just write a paragraph, it's it's not as exciting as showing an actual footage of something that happened. Um, so I think that that could really move people to action. So. Okay, since we've talked about um, committee meetings and things like that, um, Patricia, uh, how do you call for a public hearing on a bill? Anybody can call for a public hearing. What, but the problem is they don't give you a lot of advance notice on committee agendas. Like you might find out like the day before that this bill is going to be in committee the next day. 
but you just um, email the clerk, which all the clerks are listed on the website, and say, I would like to call for a public hearing on House Bill 4. And they have to do it. Um, Robin, um, going to you. Um, do you have any particular um, things that you want to share with folks that maybe you shouldn't do while advocating? I know Patricia touched on some of those, but is there anything that comes to mind to you? Um, form letters are bad news. Nobody pays attention to them. One of the things that I noticed is that when I was trying to get in touch with my legislators, they, I don't know if it was deliberate or accidental, but their contact information was incorrect. And so my letters and my, uh, my letters got returned undeliverable and my emails didn't get answered. Um, so obviously that calls for for some more investigation and Patricia offered some ideas about getting in touch with the committee clerk and and mm -hmm. other things where you could actually get some some genuine contact information it's been a source of frustration to me sure um Tara I wanted to ask you could you give us a little background on why you started the Alabama channel and how does Alabama differ from other states when it comes to sharing meetings? Yeah, uh, so the short answer is that the Alabama channel started because I feel strongly that no matter what you care about, you should know what your elected leaders are saying about it. Um, and the slightly longer answer is that it started with a desire to increase civic engagement in my community. Uh, my friend Heather Morgan and I started a group called I Vote Madison with the purpose of encouraging residents to part participate in local government. Uh, once we started, we quickly realized that the ability for citizens to watch council meetings after they happen was not available. This led to us advocating for meetings to be recorded and archived. We also began re-live streaming meetings and archiving meetings ourselves to our Facebook page and YouTube page. Our city council now records and archives their council meetings for four years. So when I realized the same thing was happening with Alabama's leg the legislature, I knew that I could do something about it. So I started the Alabama channel on Facebook in February of 2022. Later in the spring, I worked with Robin Buckaloo and Kathy Jones to take the Alabama channel on as a League of Women Voters of Alabama Education Fund project, where it could receive some grant funding and reach a wider audience. So Alabama is one of only four states who are not currently archiving their meeting footage. And in doing research, I found that states are using different methods to archive. Some like Mississippi and uh, use YouTube, while others like Tennessee are using a company called Granicus. The Alabama channel is fortunate to work with the Open Media Foundation, who handles live streaming and recording all of uh, Colorado's legislative meetings for the Colorado channel. So their search functionality allows users to search meetings by transcript. And doing further research, I've learned that Alabama is now one of a very few states that will have transcript level searchability thanks to our work. It's pretty exciting. It's, it's an incredible resource. Incredible resource. Thank you. Um, so Kathy asked, um, I noticed that several legislators were using the talking points that were used in the redistricting forum that were broadcast over Zoom. Do you have any suggestions on how to drive the narrative? Are you asking me? Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, when I was in the legislature, I went through two redistricting um, committees, and it's a joke the way we do it in Alabama. It should be done by a professional independent commission. Um, that doesn't have skin in the game, who, who lays out these districts, you know, professionally. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's, it's just a joke. And of course, we have a case making its case, uh, way through the judicial system on redistricting. But um, literally, let me, let me just share this. You know, they, they draft the districts and they will call a legislator in to the district office and say, hey, look at your map and see if what you like or don't like. And you can move, you know, your lines. Uh, I remember Oliver Robinson 
had a family member that lived just right in my district and wanted me to redraw the line so his family member would be in his district. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy the way we do it. But, you know, it should be done professionally by an independent commission. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's what I think should sure. happen. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Rebecca, I maybe I ought to clarify what I was sure. asking also. is What I was thinking was it appeared that the people in, on the floor of the legislature had list, been listening to what we were saying in those forums. I mean, I, could, I, heard, I heard some of the same verbiage, and I started thinking there's got to be it seems like there, if you can get their attention on something like that, is there is there an opportunity for us to help drive and get them to actually maybe bring up their level of understanding on some of the issues outside? So of not the necessarily redistricting, but any issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's a great question. I wish I had a good answer to it. Um, I'm I'm glad that you got their attention. Um, it, it demonstrates a position of power for the league, that they're paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and I'll well, say if anybody else I was just going to say it wasn't, it wasn't just the league, because I know we got people on the on the Zoom tonight that were not, it was not just the league, but it was a collaboration of several groups together. Just wanted to say, clarify that. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, I've got a couple more, but make sure you go ahead and put them in chat, because um, I think we're winding down. Um, I'm going to start with you on this, Tara, but anybody else who wants to weigh in, feel free. Um, but I know a lot of the things that kind of hold people back from advocating are feeling like they are not an expert on the issue or they don't have all of the answers to the issue. So how do you overcome that? How do you advocate on an issue that maybe you don't feel fully versed in? Um, I feel like it comes down to telling your personal story about the legislation. Um, what I've heard from uh, former Representative Mike Ball recently, well, he appeared at a city council meeting here in Madison advocating for medical marijuana, that he had been against ma medical marijuana for many years. And it took a grandmother emailing him to let, um, let him know that medical marijuana could really help their granddaughter. And that's, he says, what changed his mind on pushing for medical mar marijuana. And then he became the sponsor of the bill and the champion of medical marijuana across the state. And now, you know, we're, we're about to have uh, licenses called for medical marijuana and um, state or cities are passing ordinances to allow the sale of it. So it's really gone a long way. Um, Madison is not one of those cities who adopted the ordinance, but um, at Huntsville and Athens, and I believe Decatur as well, have all adopted it. So. Pretty so he went from being an opponent to an yeah. advocate. Yes, it, and that was my bill originally, and I handed it to Mike because uh, I knew uh, a Republican ex-law enforcement person would have more power to get it passed. It was It's a powerful story to get Carly's law passed. Um, it was a bill that got no dissenting votes in either chamber. Um quite a, an incredible story and i know mike's just released a book where he talks about this and um yeah but it's it's a we're gonna miss mike ball robin do you have anything to add on that i would just say that most people don't realize that their personal story gives them more expertise mm -hmm. than any member of the state legislature so you should never feel like you don't know enough because likely you're going to know more than anybody else because it's your story. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question come in through the chat. Um, wanted to know a little bit more about uh, Medicaid expansion, maybe the chances in Alabama, who, who is the appropriate person that would, could make that happen in Alabama? Alabama Rise is the expert on Medicaid expansion. I would strongly encourage you to go to their website and sign up for their updates and donate to them. Uh, they've been advocating this for a long time. I don't expect this to happen. Um, although we have a lot more rural legislators who are seeing hospital closes 
closings in their area that they realize it's due to not expanding Medicaid. We're so far behind this curve, but Alabama Rise is really the expert on Medicaid expansion. And the League of Women Voters is a, of Alabama is a member of Alabama Rise. And uh, Barbara Cadell mentioned the Cover Alabama Coalition, which I think all of these folks are in, involved in. Um, and so I also wanted to ask, what are some of the top issues that you will be watching this session? <laughs> Uh, we'll start with you, Patricia, since you had that oh, last. Because <laughs> no, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Um, I think what I'm going to be watching is we're going to see some more anti-transgender bills um, that are making their way across the country, which is just a daggum shame. Um, you know, one of my uh, major topics that I work on is economic tax incentives and the lack of transparency and accountability. They're gonna renew a bunch of those. Um, that takes a lot of money out of municipalities for law enforcement and public health and other things, but don't get me started. Um, so we'll have to be watching those. Um, you got a lot of young uh, freshman legislators who wanna make their mark. So they're gonna to try to introduce some really bad legislation we do have one Republican freshman legislator who's very pro removing the tax on groceries. That gives me hope that we can do that. Um, so I think those are some of the things, you know, there's a, what they call a windfall in the education trust fund budget. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. They've been talking about doing a tax rebate to taxpayers. Meanwhile, we don't pay teachers enough and, you know, that's another issue. So those are some things that I think that we need to keep our eye on. And, um, and you know, the whole criminal justice system is so out of whack um, that we really need to be watching what they're going to do with building these mega prisons and the death penalty and, and those sort of things. Um, Tara, I will go to you next. What are you watching for this session? Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested to see how Alabama is going to allocate the rest of their American Rescue Plan dollars. I know there was some talk of going into an early special session, but maybe that's not on the table as much right now, according to Patricia. Um, so hopefully um, they'll get that in order and not spend it, I think, on prisons again. Yep. <laughs> That's what some of the money has gone to prisons. Yep. Uh, I have a strong interest in seeing some of that money and some of the Alabama Education Trust Fund surplus money be spent on improving air quality in our K through 12 schools to reduce the transmission of airborne illnesses through our schools, because I think that affects our entire community um, when we have children that are out sick. And there is something we can do about it by increasing ventilation and adding portable HEPA filtration. And so I have done some work in that area and continue to do that. So I'll be very interested to see if, if we can do something in, in that respect. And Robin? We have a, a short list of things that we can plan in advance that we're watching. So we will be watching for additional voter suppression efforts. We want to push automatic voter registration. We, I mentioned the driver's license bill. We'll be following that again. Uh, I mentioned the Reproductive Health Forum. We'll be following any, anything, any movement in the laws on that. And what we would like to see is uh, a, re a relaxing of some of the restrictions, particularly to protect young girls uh, who have, gotten caught in a, you know, in a bad situation. 10 year old should not have to have a baby. Um, the transparency effort is one that we're going to push again. And we are part of the Alabama Voting Rights Coalition, and we are gonna be trying again to get a bill through the legislature that will make it easier for the formerly incarcerated to um, get back their rights to vote. Mm -hmm. And I know one thing that I've heard of um, that I think is going to be coming back up again is the Divisive Concepts Bill. Uh, it's kind of an anti-CRT education bill. Um, although it's worded so vague and nonspecific that it kind of is just a scary 
<laughs> a it's scary an threat. Tactic. Exactly. Um, that's a, oh, go ahead. I add something. That's a really good point that you brought up about the divisive concepts. You know, oftentimes bills take years to go through the legislature, and we can learn a lot now from the Alabama channel by typing in CRT or divisive concepts, and we can see what legislators have said about that during the past session, and that can help shape some of the what we want to say for the yes. next session. So um, pay attention to those things. And, and I will connect that thought, Tara, with a really great comment that we have in the chat. Um, this is why we all should be getting proactive in speaking with um, our legislators instead of waiting to react to the ridiculous stuff that they propose. And this tool can give you a jump on some of the arguments that were being made last year. Um, you can see how things change and shift. Um, uh, Kathy, you said we will have a record. Yeah. Yes, I was just saying that, you know, one of the things that I had heard Anthony Daniels talking about how a few years ago he had tried to get a, a provision for, for incest or rape of, of a woman that are of a, anyone that's basically gets pregnant and, but you know, there's no record because there was no recording. Right. Now we're going to have it on record and we're going to, it's going to be there. And that may be part of the reason they're not comfortable with being recorded, but, but they need to, they're going to be held accountable. And, and just to, you know, give y'all some background, if you're, you're not aware and, and some of the reason that Alabama channel is so invaluable or, Invaluable, yes, um, is because if you look at the official records of the legislature, they are purely the text of the bill, how, what the vote was, um, and you really don't get any context clues beyond that. And so this really is a huge game changer for us because you can, you know, go back and review some of those arguments that are made. And I'm I'm very curious to see how this is actually you know, you could tell when legislators start to become more aware that people were actively watching them, even though audio was streamed for quite a long time. Um, people would refer to it on the floors and even in the committees recently. Um, and so this is going to be a big deal um, in, in accountability um, because people weren't watching in the past. Um, people weren't holding them accountable. Um, so this is a big deal. Yeah, we oftentimes we'll see maybe 30 people in an entire state of Alabama watching a committee meeting. Um, now you'll see a whole lot more eyes on that committee meeting. As long as it's being live streamed and we capture it, then people will see it. Yep. Um, so I am not seeing any more questions. Um, if y'all do, last chance to drop them in the chat. But I did want to go around and give the panelists um one more chance to to close if they had anything they wanted to say. So, uh, Tara, I'll start with you. I pointed down. You're probably not down on other people's screen, but. Um, so basically, I, I want you to go out and use the tool. I want you to play with it, get familiar with it, get familiar with Allison. Now's the time to prepare for the legislative session. And so please, please do that. And then if anybody has any direct questions or wants to reach me, um, you can just email me and I'll put it in the chat. It's the Alabama channel at lwval.org. Um, please reach out to me or you can reach out through the website, through the Facebook page. Um, I'll be behind all of those pages. So, so please reach me. Um, Robin? Just find the thing that you're passionate about. Find the thing that you want to change. There are plenty of things that need to be changed in Alabama. And what we're trying to offer is the tools to make you effective in making those changes. And we want to stand with you on it. And then Patricia, is there anything else you'd like to add? We, we cannot change Alabama unless we take action. And that's just the bottom line. You got to be invested in change. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I'm going to go to Kathy um, to see if there's anything we need to talk about in closing. But thank you all for sticking through it. Um, I think we had some really great discussions, some really great tools for folks. 
Um, I appreciate you joining us. Kathy? All right. Thank you. I, um, I wanted to just take a moment and thank you again for, for joining us tonight. And we had a really fantastic discussion. And this is, this is the kind of thing we all need to consider part of our getting engaged, civic engagement is something that you, you know, we don't do enough of. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think the more you get involved, the more you're going to get from it. And I agree with all the comments that the panelists have made. Um, I did want to point out that we've got another panel on February the 13th. And this is uh, a panel focused on voter suppression. And it's the first in our, uh, it's one of our, I guess we had a panel last week on voting rights restoration. We're gonna have one that gives sort of the big picture view of voter suppression in Alabama. We've got a stellar panel. Uh, we've got Dylan Nettles, who is voting rights uh, lead for ACLU Alabama. We've got um, Brian Lorge, who is our VRR lead for the League of Women Voters of Alabama. And then we've got um, attorney Duell Ross from Legal Defense Fund, uh, NAACP, who if you followed the Milligan versus Merrill case, he was actually the one that uh, made the oral arguments on that case to the Supreme Court. And so we're gonna bring them together to talk about voter suppression in Alabama. Uh, Stephanie Butler, who's from out of the Birmingham League, she's gonna be our moderator. And I just wanna ask all of you to please join us then. Um, we'd like for you to join the league if you haven't, if you're not already a member, but uh, that's not required to join us on these Zooms because we want everybody to participate. Um, look forward to our next time we get together. And I want to say good night and have a good have a good week.